So, I mean, there are other hedges we'll look at, but hopefully people will tell me that they are of ancient origin. Um, this used to be grass here, didn't it? Yeah. Well, up, up to this track or? This was, no, this bit was um, all overgrown mm. for a lot of years. Right. I mean, about 30 years ago, you could actually walk through here and mess about in here, but then they just let it overgrow right. until they built this about sort of 14, 15 years ago, whatever it was. Right. And you could my point, further down, we used to walk across actually before they built this. From my yeah. point of view, I'm saying this needs to be left for a while, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty diverse now. It's not as diverse as ancient woodland, but it is moving towards becoming a wood. Because the margin yeah. has been. Uh, well, the land has been put in countryside stewardship, and we've got sort of arable weed edges uh, being, that have actually been sown along the edge of the arable cultivation. <laughs> and some of the plants that actually grow there are some of the rarest sort of arable weeds we have in the country. Now, it's, it's artificial, it's been introduced, but... Uh, it's been introduced for wildlife though, hasn't yeah. it? Solely for wildlife. Yeah, it's to produce seeds, particularly for birds in the winter. Gone, but what, we, what has happened, uh, some of the rarities, there are three species that are really quite rare amongst many other species, but there's corn cockle, corn marigold and corn flower, and they have sort of developed self-perpetuating populations. So to my mind, if you've got that and they're then they are part of this, and though they're introduced and artificial, they need to be taken account of. Certainly cornflower, which is uh, a species of international conservation concern. That's the blue one, isn't it? It's the kind blue of blue one, one. Yeah. And They're not quite out yet. We probably yeah. need to come again in another two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we're well, wandering along the here. countryside, what boundary? You said it's been made countryside. <laughs> it's in uh, oh, countryside stewardship. Which means that the Heritage Foundation that farm this land here, or at least their agents farm the land here, <coughs> get paid for leaving this two metre or so strips along the side of these okay. arable fields for the wildflowers, but which in turn are producing winter food for uh, birds mainly. And some of the birds that we have here are also of international conservation concern. Not greenfinch we can hear there but we may and it's the wrong time of the year for, for birds now they've, they've finished their courtship and they're singing and they're, uh, their te territorial flights and songs and that sort of thing but we'll hear a few uh, but there's things like um, I listed about 20 different species of, of red data species that are on the area around here that need taken care of uh, there's another list with about another 20 or 30 species called the amber list and then there's a green list of birds which are could go one way or the other um, so we've got got some really rare birds here well if we hear some um, that's a wood pigeon that's, that's a green finch up there and the green finch are quite rare Greenfinch are, are, are scarce. Yes. Are scarce. Yes. When you say they're rare, is it rare in numbers that they are scattered over the countryside? They, or? they may have been. Those, those the red uh, data species have probably lost about 90, up to 90% of their national population. Wow. And why are they here then? Because, well, because things are right, because, because they've got these arable margins. Because, because, because it works, works for them. Because yeah. not only do they need the bushes to, to breed in during the at this time of the year, the summer, and they would have had a terrible time this year. Um, but in winter, they've got to get through the winter with all these seeds in here and stuff that falls off the, the arable plants uh, are helping them get through the winter. I mean, two species which everybody knows, House Sparrow and Starling, they're on that red data list. Now, House Sparrow, as you might well have noticed in this area, have declined over the last few years, and there are not so many Starlings, but we still see quite a lot of them. But taken on an international basis, where you've got house sparrows and starlings, you need to look after them because if and when things get better, you've got a nucleus of, of that, those species which can back spread out and recolonise the countryside. There's not very much information about what this landscape was. I gather from talking to the archaeologists 
But a lot of this landscape was sheep grazed. Oh, right. Sheep grazed, yeah. Which would mean this would have been very high quality grassland, uh, full of wildflowers. Uh, <coughs> there wouldn't have been, there would have been little in the way of hedges. Although I've said, you know, some may go back to Saxon times, but they might not have been, it may have only just been a ditch and a bank as a, a boundary marker between one mm -hmm. owner's land and the other yeah. owner's land. Uh, could really do with <laughs> talking, you know, to the archaeologists a bit more to get this sort of information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll contact him. Some him of these hedgerows as to how old they are, oh, just right. by looking at the species here. There's a, a formula being worked out by uh, you know, a guy called Max Hooper who wrote a book about hedges. That there is one species of tree or woody shrub for every century that the hedge has been there. Uh, you need to be very careful sometimes with using that to interpret hedges. Certainly in some of the hedges over there, they're quite rich in species, but when you poke in and look, you'll see that quite a number of the trunks have got plastic guards around them to stop the rabbits when they were actually planted, again as part of countryside stewardship some years ago, that the Heritage Foundation had to do their hedges. So it's a bit... But I'm not sure whether that went on here. I can't see any um, uh, guards. And if you look, you, what you do, you take approximately a 30 yard length. So where are we? Up here to, I suppose, where those roses are hanging down there. Mm -hmm. And look at the various species of trees. This is field maple, dog rose. Somebody counting these. Two. <laughs> Elder. Blackthorn, Hawthorn, how many is that? Five. 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 And here we've got, oh this is again Blackthorn here, uh, that's the black cat. Right, so that's about five. So, you know, 500 years old, what does that make it? Tudor? Mm, yeah. 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 Need to have a look at maybe some maps to see if it shows, uh, you know, a hedge line here in more recent times. <coughs> but I know, <coughs> certainly from a lot of work I did on Crockett Parish some years ago, that on this sort of soil type, that sort of calculation is fairly good. If it were, if it had sort of eight to ten species, it'd be sort of Norman or Saxon. Um, seven to five, that sort of thing, if you're looking at Tudor. Uh, three to four Georgian hedges, and one or two Victorian hedges, or later, more modern ones. What was that? Yeah, that's a black cat. Almost as nice as a nice oh, one.